But hopefully we'll tie together the, uh, the discussions and some of the strands of today's debate uh, into some kind of uh, reflection on uh, the context of the spaces in local government. Because whilst the work around promoting growth and leading regeneration is important in itself, I also would contend that it's important to the future um, of local government as a sector in facing up the challenges um, that, that are out there. And as everyone in this room will know, those challenges are immense. Um, and going around the country talking to people in local government, I get a real sense that there's an air of doom around the sector. And, and that's not just because of the OGA's graph of doom, the Treasury scissors of doom, and Birmingham City Council's uh, jaws of doom, which I recently discovered, which a whole slew of charts which show just how dire the financial circumstances that local government is in um, is going to become over the next five, 10 years, possibly into 20 years. Um, I think it's fair to say that there aren't too many people around the sector who are looking for the sunny uplands any time soon. Um, now, that doom is predicated on the gap, not just of um, eroding uh, funding, but also growth in service demand. Um, so it's not simply a, a question of the money not coming through, it's that people are demanding your services uh, with, uh, with increasing um, need and, and also demand. It's the, the, the two fit together. Um, so you're not going to have enough money to continue business as usual. Um, but I think this black, the burning platform of cuts um, offers one small glimmer of light. And, and don't worry, relax, I'm not about to give you a sermon on the, the purifying virtue of austerity and, and how invigorating it can be. No, the, the upside for me is that it presents local government with a really stark choice about what its future is going to be. Um, and it's maybe a choice that, that local government needed to face up to a while ago, um, but it's certainly here and it's certainly now. And if I can encapsulate that choice quite simply, on the one hand, it's to preside over an ever more eviscerating set of local services as well, uh, resources reduce and the demand goes up. <laughs> or it's to rediscover that sense of stewardship of place. Place leadership, um, you could call it leading economic growth, creating social and community resilience in your places, both to reduce demand on your service, to make sure that local people are healthier, happier, and, and, and more prosperous, but also to generate some opportunities for you to increase your resource base as well as local authorities. Now, those two choices are not, of course, an either or deal. Um, all local authorities, to a degree, need their place, and leadership place requires the ballast and the capacity that the delivery of services provides. However, it's how you see your role um, that I think is coming into stark relief. Um, I think it's fair to say, whilst having said that all local government these place. In councils over the last 60 years or so in Britain, we've become increasingly comfortable in defining ourselves in terms of the services that we provide rather than the governance of places that we, we provide. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. So we're just finishing a piece of work now which took a bunch of chief executives through a, a scenario planning game, if you like, to um, budget for the next spending review. Um, and it went through three terms. And for the first two terms, the chief executives looked at the budget lines, and they took money out of the budget lines and talked about services and reduce it. By the time we got to the third round, when it was really, really, really critical, then they started thinking about the resources of their place, you know, how they could get local economic activity going, how they could get people to, um, it, it, to provide resilience to themselves, how they could get local partners, to, uh, both in the public sector and the private sector, to bring those resources together, how those councillors, so that those councils could lead um, their local area rather than simply provide services to it. Um, and I think that those things are particularly relevant to what you've been talking about today, the stuff that Dave's been talking about in terms of um, co uh, coordinating the, the, the provision of services and resources to unemployed people to make sure people can get back into work, and not just into work, but get out of underemployment and start to be able to uh, earn a living wage as well. Shaping the economy, working out what your ideal economy is going to be and making sure that you provide for that in the future. Um, Bob Kersmake agrees. I was at a conference yesterday, and Sir Bob, the, uh, the head of the civil service, stood up and said something which I think is highly pertinent to today, and that's uh, that effective economic leadership, both locally and nationally, is going to be one of the three defining characteristics of successful public sector operations in the future. It's not just you know, a thing on the edge, it's one of the three things to define an effective public service. It's going to be that effective economic leadership. Now, NOGM published a pamphlet last year called Grow Your Own, which set out our thinking um, on these issues. Uh, we focus on the potential for councils to uh, lead, not just to be part of, but lead on two of the critical drivers of economic growth, skills and on infrastructure. 
On skills, uh, we made a whole, you know, they would, would recognize much of it. Um, but we specifically said that uh, the FE should devolve 5% of post-16 funding to councils so that they could match skills development to what they see as the evolving skills needs of their area. And we're very clear that it should be local government, not because we think the local government should get the money because, well, just give it to local government, but it's because they're the only people, as the honest broker in an area, who can start to make decisions about what future employers will need rather than simply existing employers. So there's a critical governance, stewardship role for local government in skills, as well as just being able to deliver the service better. On infrastructure, we argued that um, local authorities should start to pool investment monies, both across geographies and across uh, organisational boundaries, to set up what we're calling revolving investment funds. So these are funds which a, a, a number of uh, councils and other organisations put in resources to invest in, in infrastructure, um, which doesn't necessarily locate within their area, but which would give um, benefits back to the wider area. By pooling, you generate um, an impetus for uh, thinking in terms of functional economic geographies. By making it a recyclable fund, which you can then invest again once you get a return from it, it focuses the mind on economic activity, which is going to work, is going to produce a return. So those are the two um, <coughs> policy proposals I want to flag up from that. But the, the critical message from that report was that councils need to take uh, up the mantle of place shaper, taking greater responsibility for the economic futures of their areas. Not alone, of course, we've already said no one or agency is going to do this, but not just as one other delivery partner either. We took this idea of place leadership a little bit further in another report last year called More Lights, More Power, which set out an agenda for reimagining the role of local authority assets. Um, the title, More Lights, More Power, refers to the motto of Shoreditch and St. Leonard's Parish Church, which is now half of, of Hatley Borough in London. Uh, in 1896, Shoreditch um, and St. Leonard's Parish Church, uh, sorry, Parish Council, um, opened the Shoreditch Electric Light Station, which was an early municipal energy from waste enterprise. Um, they used to collect refuse, burn it, generate electricity for street lighting for the local area, and use the waste heat uh, in the, the neighbouring uh, municipal baths. The result, um, the council gets a revenue stream, local people get well-lit streets, and access to an affordable um, and important uh, municipal <coughs> community, community community. That kind of activity wasn't unique then, of course. Um, up in Birmingham, Joe Chamberlain was um, famously building one of the great Victorian municipalities based on the gas works that the council had acquired and was running for municipal and community benefit, generating an income to fund other services, providing cheap power to people as well. Um, so what we wanted to do was to think through what a 21st century Joseph Chamberlain um, would do, faced with the challenge of remaking local government, which is caught in this, this, the jaws of doom. You know. So we looked at how local authorities can flip their property assets from liabilities that need to be rationalised away into um, productive assets that can further their policy ambitions as well as generate revenue stream. We wanted to see uh, what the opportunities of, of the green energy revolution uh, present for um, some, some contemporary lighting power, if you like. Um, and we wanted to see what value, financial or otherwise, could be leveraged out of the intangible assets that every local authority holds, so whether that be intellectual property or the value of brand. Um, and what we found was in all of those different areas, um, there are councils doing remarkable things, from the, the redevelopment of Oxford Castle through to uh, the operation over a decade of working as power stations, which generate around about £2 million of revenue a year, um, as well as producing um, energy for the local consumers. None of those authorities, though, are relying on standard traditional services to do it. They're using the resources they have, including their legitimacy and their ingenuity something that um, Joe Chamberlain described as sagacious audacity. And I think that we're at the stage where local government needs a little bit more sagacious audacity. The great platforms of services back then hadn't been established, so the councils had no option but to use that creative commerciality, if you like, and a commitment to their place to generate a, a, an organisation. We're in a different position. We've got a legacy of services. We have a legacy of, of sectoral requirements. So that makes it actually far more difficult than starting a blank sheet but something of a similar scale is in order. <coughs> now this is difficult and, and risky terrain for us in local government, uh, and it takes us out of what I would hesitate to call uh, our comfort zone, both because it's an, an appalling cliche, but also because it doesn't feel very comfortable at the moment. Um, I was at a conference where the uh, Regen director from Newcastle said, um, what we're trying to do is very risky, but we've taken a decision that it's less risky than doing nothing. And so we're in this position where the comfort zone is uncomfortable. 
but it's still uh, a difficult transition, but it's one we need to make, and it's, it's a particularly difficult transition for elected members, because it's about moving from the certainty of formal control to the uncertainty of influence. Um, now that transition looks like giving up power, and um, that's a difficult thing to do. But it only looks like that if you see power as a finite resource, which I don't, and it only builds up lots of control if you have uh, an overinflated sense of the, the, the power that lies in formal control. Formal control is certain, but it's increasingly limited in its power. Influence, conversely, is uncertain, but its, its potential um, is limitless. And that power as influence is the bread and butter of place leadership, of regeneration. In that area, there are no levers to pull. You can't simply get X department to do Y. Uh, you have to spot the opportunities and then assemble the resources to realize it. What I hope that today's very long day has given you from across the range of speakers you have is a sense both of the ideas and the tools you need, not only to um, face up the incredible challenges facing your um, local economies, but also your own local authorities. Um, as we argued in, in Grow Your Own, our region report, um, local government is essentially the last man standing in this field. Government, national government, has kind of backed away from any kind of place based industrial policy. policy. Um, you guys are the last men and women outstanding. Um, you don't have any option, but you have to start to leave. That's all right. The first two, the first two features of it are to help to start improving our education system by ameliorating the disbalance of children actually arrive in school. We cannot compete with, with other countries while our children are going to school unable to eat, unable to speak, unable to walk according to recent report because of the poverty of their upbringing in lots of cases. But these ameliorating needs addressing forever to be competitive. The other thing is that whilst a half of any family is having to be engaged in childcare, we are dangerously underusing under under the um, resources and capacities of our country. And it's something that I hear less and less about every day. And the only thing I've heard from this entire government is a proposal that we should make our childcare services worse by providing a worse ratio. And I, I just don't see how we can get ourselves out of the mess we're in and it simply addresses that issue. No, I have to say, in, in terms of, uh, of, of tackling uh, unemployment and activity uh, you know, for um, one's parents, uh, it, it's absolutely critical, and uh, especially so uh, in London. Yeah, and it is at its sharpest uh, in London, there's no doubt about it. It's an issue everywhere, but it's its sharpest uh, in, in London. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the problem, I think, is that um, we have uh, not paid sufficient attention to uh, how uh, we're stimulating you know, the emergence of just more provision. Um, and uh, also at the same time, of course, uh, gradually uh, over the years and decades, local government has, has progressively withdrawn from running direct day nurseries and so forth, and it's down to you know, basically those children you know, in, 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 in need on the, on the uh, risk of uh, uh, which leaves it all in the private uh, and voluntary sector and therefore subject to uh, the uh, straight market forces. Now, from uh, where I sit, um, it is a classic example uh, of uh, that there is a failure in the market which does justify the intervention you know, by government. Uh, the problem is that um, I think we've probably left it too late because the bill is far too big, uh, and therefore the, uh, uh, the the it's not surprising to me that the government has just uh, looked at how you therefore just reduce uh, the quality on offer 
uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, hoping that that will lead to an increase uh, in supply, or reduce the requirements on, on providers to, to then increase the uh, supply. Now, I think with every single interview that I saw or private nursery providers uh, following that announcement, I don't think one of them said that they were going to increase uh, the, uh, uh, the number of places. Uh, they're all saying, let's wait and see. Uh, and of course, the concern is that they just take it as more profit. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the dynamics are mucked up uh, of the market. Uh, how uh, we, we get around it, is a difficult question for everybody. Yeah, it is. I, I, I don't think too many people will disagree with the importance of that. I mean, you should be in a conference like yesterday because Charlie was mentioned all the time. But um, anyway, uh, it's not. A, it's not a. Well, maybe it is just a, a random correlation that um, those countries which spend most on childcare, particularly Nordic countries, have done best through this economic downturn. There, there's, a, there's a massive correlation between economic performance and. Childcare. Um, that is right. The, the, the lag between where we need to get to uh, and where we are now is massive, and uh, you know, within the jaws of death, so straightforward local authority provision is going to be really quite difficult to argue for. Yeah. Um, so I think that we need to be more creative, and we need to recognise that probably a large chunk, if not the majority, of childcare that goes on in this country, no one in this room knows about because it's informal, um, and you work with the grain of that rather than simply trying to put a net of uh, regulation across it, um, that's, that's difficult to say and do, but I think that um, we need to work with what we have. We need to bring together those resources that exist in the community, whether it be um, schools which have um, budgets for, particularly the academy sector, which have, which have budgets that they can bring in uh, as independent um, uh, entities, whether there are employers, you can see the value in investing in that, maybe putting something into one of these in revolve, making a case within a revolving investment fund that by investing in this now, you can get the return later. So I think you need to be far more creative in thinking about this, because unless we get this back, UK PLC is going to continue to lag. Yeah, I'm the chairman, but I'll go off piste here. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've read, read a consecutive reports, one of the ones coming out this week, that you have three-year-olds uh, going to school who are incapable of walking, using mm -hmm. instructor in a buggy, incapable of using a knife, have not done that basic 2020. Do we really believe it's the role of the state to solve all those Absolutely. issues? Yeah. I mean, it's the role of it's not. It's the role. It's the role. Surely, the role of parents have a responsibility uh, to, uh, to to uh, to to uh, to deal with them and uh, to deal with this. And we should. And it's about an issue about resilience that has not been done. Uh, 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 and uh, somehow, um, what we seem to be lacking in all of this. Is it the, the role of parenting skills, the role of education in doing that? Simply seeing that every issue can somehow be solved by throwing money through the state. The, the state at it. Uh, sorry about that contentious part of this time of the year, uh, the agenda. So, sorry, anyway, if any further questions. No, I, I was just going to say, I, could, I couldn't agree with you more. As um, the mother of a three year old, I would say and I brought her up as a single mum and I always managed to work. I just wonder sometimes if where we need to start from, I, I know it's old fashioned and I'll probably get absolutely around, but don't we go back to basic principles where we start and we encourage young people to understand the consequences of what they're doing, whether it's about their offending, whether it's about their, um, if it's not criminal offending, their attitudes, whether it's about the, the way that they use um, things to bully one another. <coughs> haven't, haven't we absolutely lost the plot? And we actually start to say, well, yeah, you can do that if you like, but it's down to you to get yourself out of the mess. I'll help you where I can, but it won't be my problem. And until we actually start to make people understand the consequences of what they're doing, councils should not be the people who have to pick up all the bits. We've got to start and make people understand. <coughs> Over in, in, in Sweden, I work for a Swedish company. Yes, the Nordics have had more um, involvement and more investment in childcare. They also have smaller families and they also on average start their families later. It's a lifestyle option. I, I, I think we need to be clear in terms of, of, of differentiating the 
the need for childcare, um, specifically in terms of like Sure Start or the early intervention trusters um, and, and pilots, which is really targeted at you know the troubled families, yeah. As opposed to what well, I, you know, I think the, the question w was aimed at was the general affordability, yeah, to everybody for childcare, yeah, you know, and that ranges up, you know, the pay scale through to the, <laughs> the middle classes, yeah, uh, and that's what I was addressing my my, my question to is so how how do we generate more affordable childcare for everybody? But yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of who is doing what, you know, for you know those families who've got significant problems. Uh, then uh, you know that that that's subject to yet another raft of interventions. I think that um, as I brought up two children and worked through the government all my working career, and I think local government is important as an example because I couldn't have done what I've done without flexible working. So if, gov if local government could actually do that, you know, live it, and, and publicise to employers that you can employ women and men on flexible arrangements, the world is going to come to an end, all your clients aren't going to disappear. I mean, in the legal profession, it's no better now than it was 25 years ago. No better now, although and I think local government could do more without any cost to advertise good employment practices, particularly on flexible working, where that is absolutely crucial if you're going to manage to bring up children and work. Right, I'm going to take two final points. Um, I, did you have your right uh, I, I, was, I was just going to say that all research shows that people have smaller families later if women are better educated and have better education, uh, better op uh, or occupational opportunities. You get large families early in, in countries and, and societies where women get better opportunities. Um, do you have a point to make? Thank, I, thanks, yeah, it's also in terms of young people at Common Global Power City Council. Um, I've been to a number of events of lit where uh, it's very welcome that companies are bringing engineering and construction back into this country uh, and, and getting that moving. Um, what companies are saying to us time and time again is about the skills shortage. You know, I mentioned Pirelli earlier, and they were saying they have to bring engineers in from Italy because they, the specialist engineers don't even exist in this country, let alone in our county. Um, and, but one of the concerns I have is when I go with the mayor in, in, in some schools, and you say to young people, what do you want to do when you grow up? When I was a child, the toys were things like Lego, and Meccano, I'm dating myself now, Meccano, Lego. Now it's karaoke machines, mobile phones, iPads, whatever. Um, so when you talk to young people, then you say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be famous. Not I want to be a train driver, I want to be an engineer. And when young people are up to doing their GCSE options, that is too late. And I just wonder whether you have any thoughts on how we get the school system to consider engineering and construction much, much earlier. So by the time they're doing their options, they're already thinking um, because at the moment, I think the last stat I saw was that the largest proportion of people in engineering jobs are within 10 years of retirement. So the problem yeah. we've got now is nothing compared to the problem we're going to have in 10 years. Yeah. Good question, Phil. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, the uh, well, as uh, the Wolf Report was saying, uh, in, you know, in general, um, that uh, we we do need to uh, yet again, uh, it has been said before make sure that there is a, a valid and valued uh, vocational route uh, for young people. Um, and you know, I do believe, um, you know, as it's downsides, I know, but I do believe that those choices should be there uh, from 14 upwards. Uh, I do think that we need to uh, learn from uh, again how Germany manages its apprenticeship system. Um, you know, it, you can't pick it up and plonk it here, but there are lessons that can can be learned. Um, but um, we've dillied and dallied around this policy, um, and I'm not necessarily seeing it going in the right direction. Of course, you yeah, uh, know. In terms of particularly today, uh, reform of GCSEs and so forth is thrown up into the air again. Um, um, 
you know, but <laughs> what you're saying is is right in terms of what em employers are saying that that skills mismatch is going to be there. There isn't a short term fix, yeah. And the sooner we start on on that fix, yeah, uh, well, not, yeah. There, there are plenty of things which which are. Uh, if you like, uh, either being thought about or tested or piloted and started on. Um, um, but the sooner we start on it, you know, the, uh, the sooner we'll arrive at a position where we can genuinely be saying, we've got skilled engineers here and so forth, come to this country. Um, absolutely on apprenticeships. I think apprenticeships are the, the big missing link in our, in our skills package. I mean, it's great that, that it's expanded its program over the last five years. But essentially, we know that still because they place legitimately. And um, just imagine if we put even half of the, the, the low cost um, capital financing that we put at students at apprenticeships. Just imagine how massive that program would go. Um, we, would, we would see an explosion of income pressures. Now, you need to have apprenticeships in what? So we've got engineering coming back to the country, which meant that training people 10 years ago to do would have been frankly pointless. The other issue around the skills gap that employers have is that when we talk to employers about, so you said the skills gap, what are the skills? They can't get beyond um, the skills that's, that are lacking from the particular job they're recruiting to today. Now, there's no reason why they should, because they're not policy makers. So local government has a critical role in brokering um, projections of the skills needs across a sector, whether it's a real sector that exists now or might come back in five years, because individual employers they complain about um, skills gaps. So when you actually sit down and say, what are the skills? They, they, can, they come to a few very, very specific technical skills. But generally, it's just that the people aren't, they have the right attitude. I hope that. We did a load of interviews around the Greater Own Airport, and loads and loads of open employers, when, you, when we push them, what the skills gap was, it was, well, people just don't have the right attitude. Now, that's not something you can do either through a class uh, education or through an apprenticeship. There's something about motivation in there. But that's not a skills gap. I think that there are things that we need to do to make sure we've got technical skills. This is about work readiness. I think there's an awful lot to be said to the group training association bringing local employers together uh, under the auspices of the local community to bring the, the, the skills needs into contact with the, the supply of young people who are going to develop those skills. So I think that that it isn't simply responding to what everybody in the does, it's, it's actually working with the to find those skills far more quickly. And that goes back to that leadership place that it does.